Hello, everyone, and welcome to this exciting Civilizations in Review. I'm here with Paula, our phenomenal content writer, and Abby, our development and advocacy development and advocacy coordinator, to talk all about the Parthian Empire, an exciting, exciting one. First and foremost, thank you, Paula, for being here. And I want to reiterate all the wonderful places that you will find this great call. You're currently seeing us here on Facebook, but we'll also will be added to our YouTube, our website, our Instagram, and our Spotify. So you can hear us and listen and learn all about this wonderful empire. Thank you again for being here, Paula. I'm going to throw it to Abby to read the 101 word introduction, and we'll jump right into this. Great. Uh, in 247 BCE, a nomadic tribe known as the Parni settled in what is now northeastern Iran. Parthia evolved from a satrapy of the Seleucid Empire into a vast and powerful empire in its own right. The Parthian Empire ruled over Mesopotamia until 224 CE. At its zenith, it ruled over a vast area as far west as the Mediterranean and as far east as India and China. Although the Parthian Empire left little lasting effect on Mesopotamia during its time, it was a force to be reckoned with that managed to keep the Roman Empire and many others at bay. Yes, let, let's jump into this. Um, I, I think this is really exciting because now we're at the point where a lot of the civilizations we have sort of like sandwich each other as, as they did anyways, but we did the Sasanian Empire uh, couple weeks ago, we're doing the Seleucid Empire, so kind of that sandwich for the Parthians. Um, so thank you for writing this, but also being here to continue that conversation for the uh, Persian empires writ large. Let's just, let's jump into this. What is the Parthian Empire best known for? We'll start there. Um, well, there's so much. I think uh, one of the challenges was that because there's no writings that date back to the exact time frame of the Parthian Empire, but we have so much information from those around them and those who came after them. Um, they were known for so many different things and different sources highlight different things. And one thing is they were known for their military tactics, but then they're also known for their vast trade networks and their architecture. Um, I think for me being the anthro enthusiast that I am, I enjoyed thoroughly looking through uh, the Met Museum has this vast collection and it shows all their different artifacts and pieces from their monuments. And you can kind of see this um, empire come to life through all these objects as well. Was there anything in looking through the Met collection that stood out to you particularly? Um, it's actually, if you look at the article itself on the website, the main picture that is there is from the Met collection and it's very interesting. So you should look at it. I could do no justice trying to explain what it looks like. It's just, it is the quintessential uh, unique Parthian style is the best way to explain it. And it does showcase kind of the fluidity of the movements, circular motions and how they worked with all these different elements. So it's, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of the civilizations is seeing their most beautiful impact, at least just for the photo. And the Parthians is one of the easiest ones to find because of its <laughs> well-documented connection. I, I think my, one of my favorite parts of these talk box is how extensive the trade routes are, just in okay. general. But thinking today, you know, global commerce, buy something online, it comes from, you know, 7,000 miles away. They physically walked in along the Silk Road or other trade routes. And I find that just so interesting. Um, Tell us more about that and how the Parthians were a part of a trading empire. Well, w one of the things that I was incredibly interested in and it, it was surprising because going in, I didn't really know much about the Parthian empire. I heard about it in passing, but that was it. Like I recognized the name and that was about all. Um, and then looking into it, how it slowly expanded uh, across Mesopotamia and it had acts, not only like land mass, it was huge and it connected the east to the west in ways that had not really happened so much before but then on top of that it had access to all these different ports which gave access to even further areas of the world so it had access to the black sea the caspian sea um the persian gulf so it was able to have connections with china it had connections with the roman empire of course it had connections with india central asia markets it it was huge like it doesn't sound like much now in our globalized world where as you said you can just click something and next thing you know something from across the globe reaches your doorstep you don't have to move nothing but the amount of labor and effort that goes into this at this time frame is unfathomable it's it's awe-inspiring really 
Uh, you speak a little bit in your article about how this trading system was made. I mean, you don't say this directly, but made possible by the ruling system that they had. Yeah. Uh, and at this time, of course, vassal states were very common. Uh, the Parthian Empire was a vassal before it became an empire. Can you speak a little bit to, uh, this is the poly that I nerd in me, but a little bit to how they uh, ruled over the settlements they had and how that might have looked similar to the Seleucid Empire before them or or not? Um, so poli nerd here as well, so I totally understand. Um, so it was very, the easiest way to conceptualize it is kind of a feudal type of uh, um, structure. So later on, the um, Parthian kings were known as the king of kings. So, or that's what they called themselves as. It was the fact that they would take over these great kingdoms around them and expand, but they never, got rid of the ruling system there. And it's very similar to what the Seleucids did where they had all these small provincial kingdoms that made up this large empire. The one difference that they did switch, which was very, um, it talks about, it shows how uh, critical thinking this empire was, is the fact that they went and split up the satrapies because they themselves used to be a satrapy and they split them up into smaller provinces so it would make it harder for those provinces to rebel and take over, basically making it impossible for one of their provinces to do what they themselves did to get into power. So it was very Machiavellian in a very interesting way. I was like, aha, uh -huh. okay, I see what you're doing. It's like learning how you went up the ladder and then just kind of kicked the ladder away so nobody else can do it that same way. So it was, it was interesting. And then being the history nerd that I uh, am, I also kind of saw some differences and similarities between how the Roman Empire expanded and how the Parthian Empire expanded. Um, I think in many ways, the Parthians were a little bit less heavy handed than the Romans were, but they still had this kind of ingenuity of knowing that you shouldn't change too much of what you're taking over in order for it to still run effectively. So well, yeah. I'm also a poli sci nerd and history nerd. So this is, this is <laughs> hitting all of these check boxes. This is so fascinating. I think it's I think it's ingenious in a way too. This is how we overthrew the empire before us. We're not going to let that happen again. And <laughs> yeah. in essence, they didn't because a whole other empire then took them over. But um, I mean, they lasted yeah, for they, they did survive for four and a half centuries yeah. though. Yeah. yeah, they knew what they were doing. Incredible. Um, it's especially you know to to be really in the in the center of all of this Mesopotamian Eastern Asian trading centers yeah. to hold basically that land for four hundred years is. No small feat. Good job, Parthians. Well done. <laughs> um, I, I, I really love this idea of trading and I, I really want to hit on a little bit more. I just think it's so fascinating. The, the Royal Road you mentioned several times throughout, uh, you know, basically a Silk Road equivalent uh, as yeah. far as I'm aware, but do you have more details on the Royal Road and just their international relations? So the Royal Road basically uh, further, it was the power, the, the amount of trade that came from the Royal Road was then expanded because of all the ports that they had access to. But if you really think of the landmass that it went through and the fact that it managed to connect, even though it wasn't at great levels, they managed to connect with China and the Chinese emperor at the time sent envoys through the Royal Road. And then they traded lightly and had this relationship that you don't really see that often during these times. And then that in itself connected China to the rest of the world through the Royal Road. So it's, I found it really interesting. And of course, just like you mentioned, it's like a Silk Road in a different time. So a vastly different time. That's super interesting. I wanna to touch back a little to something you mentioned before, which appears to be a major theme of their rule was their relationship with the Romans and their ability to hold them off. Uh, I know they were in, or I believe that they were, I can't remember if I read this on your article or elsewhere, that they, they, yeah, you wrote about it, uh, had a 200 year peace treaty yeah. uh, with the Romans. So the first thing that came to mind uh, when seeing that was almost like a cold war of sorts, ideologically or religiously, they were using different, uh, following different religions. Um, just the fact that that aggression uh, maintained itself uh, for that long, but that they were able to, uh, to hold it off is, is pretty interesting. And I was hoping you could speak more to that. So, um... I, I can, I actually looked further into it to, just to see how it looked like. 
And it was just interesting to see that you see these ebbs and flows of conflict and then peace and conflict. And so it wasn't continuous. And beyond that 200 year peace treaty, there was different conflicts during different uh, emperors and kings. And it all starts back to like the mid nineties BCE and then goes all the way towards the very end of that empire. And so it's just, it's interesting. And then it also speaks to the power of the Parthian empire that it managed to sit down sit down at a table and you have King Freydes the second, I think, or no, King Freydes the fourth. Sorry, there was many of those. So many kings, so many names, so, so many numbers. But you have King Freydes the fourth and Augustus, which is, if you know Roman history, Augustus was huge. He was almost seen as a god among emperors. And the fact that he sat down and made a peace treaty means that they, the Parthians posed enough of a threat that they didn't want to get that deep into war with them at the time. Obviously later on, Rome managed to, because there was, I think, four different periods of time where they go into war. And during the last two, that's where you start seeing the Parthians uh, decline and you start seeing the Romans slowly chipping away. But it's very strategic at the same time because it wasn't just that the Romans defeated them. It wasn't that. You have the Romans chipping away, the Kushite Empire also chipping away at them, which I believe we also cover the Kushite Empire in Alphazaic as well. Um, and then you also see uh, one of the kingdoms within Parthia, you see one brother take over another brother's kingdom, you see somebody else. So there's strife inside, there's strife all around on all of its borders, and that's how it finally comes to its end. And it, it took more than just Rome to defeat this empire. And then the, I don't know, I'm, I'm a huge history nerd. I studied the Roman empire and to like sit down and see that this empire that I rarely read or heard too much about managed to stave off Roman advan advances for centuries. It's it's impressive. It's really interesting uh, to hear you sort of illustrate what it would have looked like for those two kings to be at one table. Um, you might be able to fact check this because you sound like you know more than me, but I heard an interesting story about them negotiating peace that the Parthians captured one of their legion's uh, eagle standards. Uh, <laughs> And so when they negotiated to give that back to the Romans, Augustus then took that back and used it as propaganda as like, look at us, we won this major battle when in fact he had negotiated this thing. And just to get a little bit nerdier about it, since you also like anthropology, apparently that's what's illustrated in the famous Augustus statue, Prima Porta in the Vatican Museum, which I've seen and did not know the context of. So just like all of those dynamics. And I think you're doing such a good job of bringing what that actually would look like to life. Literally these, these two guys at the table, one goes home and, you know, uses it as propaganda is pretty, it's just funny. And it's, yeah. Well, again, it's, it's the Roman Eagle we're talking about. It's how many movies, books, documentaries have been done about the multiple instances where this happened, where all it took is you take the Roman eagle and you suddenly have this chess piece because the Roman eagle stands for the empire. And especially under Augustus where you have, uh, he's seen as a god. There's these myths around his birth and um, the fact that when Caesar died, there was this, uh, I think it was when Caesar died and he is, assumes power, there was this um, comet through the sky. Like he was made up to be a god and tied to all the deities around him. And so of course he couldn't just, say, oh, you know what? I sat down at a table and I, I agreed on peace. No, it had to be something else. The Romans during multiple different periods, but especially during this period were masters of propaganda. And that's again, the piece that you're describing, all the different pieces that portray Augustus, it's, it's propaganda of its time. It's all of the symbolisms that are made so he is the victor no matter what happens. And of course, people in Rome don't know as much of what is going on. They didn't have, for example, the 24 hour news cycle that we do. So in, in, if you read what all the different politicians are writing, unless these people actually went all the way across the world to figure out what was going on, they only knew what was being told to them. So if he comes back and says, I won, and then makes this huge uh, piece of artwork to portray it, of course, everyone's like, yes, that is exactly what happened. This man is a God and this man did this. And, Hooray, we have our eagle back. <laughs> I love that equivocation to modern propaganda. I mean, I have also, I haven't been to it, but I've seen that statue. And to know that that's connected directly to this peace treaty with the Parthians is a part that is very much lost in, I think, most people's yeah. understanding of the Roman Empire. And I love that 
Abby, you brought this. Thank you for your anthropological background and, and Paula for bringing this article to light because that's exactly why we have civilizations at all on Alphuzek's website. I mean, the Roman Empire, yes, was in the Middle East often. They are not one of our 75 empires, largely for that purpose, to showcase all of the other stories that we are not talking about and should be. Um, so yes, obviously the peace treaty with Rome is very significant and all over the place. And we're gonna mention the Roman empire uh, for sure, but that's not going to have its own place on Alphuzek because there are so many other cool, oh, interesting, yeah. unique historical dimensions to explore. And, and thank you for choosing the Parthians. And well, is fighting, fighting the propaganda and, actively. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll take it, absolutely. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious of all of the 75, what, what drew you to the Parthians in the first place um, when you chose this empire? So it, I think it was mainly because I, there's so many empires and it stood out because I recognized the name but I couldn't place where exactly I recognize the name from. And being the history nerd that I am, I've been reading about like, I literally used to read through historical encyclopedias as a child for fun. <laughs> yeah. And so I was just Same. like, from <laughs> that, is that where I recognize it from? Or is it from the history podcast I listened to or the documentaries or the shows like, there's so many historically based works that I've read or watched that I had no idea where I recognize it from, but it was nagging. Like, I recognize this, I don't know why. And so it was a blessing in the sense that I was a blank canvas. I, I jumped into it like Alice going down the rabbit hole. It's just like, whatever information came up, I was like, ooh, like it, I didn't have a thesis or a question in mind. It was just, I want to know more just be the sponge that ingests information and then comes up with what I'm gonna write. So it was it was incredibly fun. At least I'm one of those people, I find this fun. Like give me something I know nothing about and just jump into it and just dive and immerse yourself with all the information, so. That's so great. I think we can all relate to that. I think that's why Alphazaic has what, 60 plus content writers for just a bunch of nerds who like to spend their Saturdays talking about ancient <laughs> history. Um, one piece connecting history to the modern day that I thought was interesting was you said the legacy of their language in Iranian and Armenian. And yes. I was hoping you could tell us more. So I wish that I was really good at pronouncing words in different languages. And then I would totally be like, hey, let me talk about all these words, but I'm gonna do your ears a service and not try to <laughs> do that. But um, I think it's interesting in the sense that we don't, as I said before, we don't have actual evidence of written Parthian from the Parthian Empire's time frame. There is writings from Parthia, the smaller province of Parthia, after um, the Sassanid Empire takes over. So that's from the period that we have the writings. But when you look at Armenia and you look at Iran and you look at the time frames when these words were adopted and how far back they go, you see that during the Parthian Empire, you see the largest number of uh, loan words being shared. And if you look at these countries now, it's like, if you look at a map, how does one country way over here have shared words with a country all the way over there? Like, how does this happen? And it happens because of all these trade networks and the fact that it, the empire expanded so much that it actually had both of these countries within its borders. And it's something that you think about when it comes to other things like Greek or Latin, but you don't really think about it with Parthian because it's technically considered a dead language in many ways. But at the same time, I personally, again, being the history and anthro nerd that I was, I also really enjoyed reading that even though there wasn't that much written evidence left over, there was this rich tradition of oral history and that's how you learn of all these different words. So again, it was so interesting and I wish I had an hour or two hours to talk about it, but yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's great. And I think it's so interesting how you don't even have to go too far back to find like the only traces of uh, not just an ancient civilization, but a political state are through the language bits that have been carried through. So again, going with anthropology, the linguistic anthropology, following that trail is so interesting. Um, I mentioned before the call that I had a nerdy piece of pop culture related to oral history, kind of, forgive me, this is the biggest tangent in the entire world. Um, but so going back to Rome and the Parthians relationship, Rome was polytheistic and the Parthians were monotheistic. The uh, uh, Parthians practiced 
Zoroastrianism. You can tell that I Googled all of this last night down a rabbit hole as well. <laughs> and uh, I was reading about it and it mentioned that they, that they worshiped one individual as their God sort of. And then I saw there was a phrase associated with how they would uh, worship him called good thoughts, good deeds, good words. And I sat there for 15 minutes and I said, I know that phrase. How do I know that phrase? It's because in the film, Bohemian Rhapsody, Freddie Mercury says that his father would often tell him that as a piece of advice. So whether or not this is true, I like to think that Freddie Mercury is uh, connected to the Parthian Empire. Well, that is because he's, he's, he's Zoroastrianism. Like that's the, that was the religion of Freddie Mercury and his family. So. Yes, you're right. Yes, there is, we go. So he, he was the modern a day descendant. influence. Yeah, that's it. And that's their influence on language today is the entire queen. So thank you. Uh, I think we're done. Thank no, we're not. But what a phenomenal <laughs> tie-in. Yeah, no, he's like, bye. <laughs> it, it was a whole thing in his biopic. And just for those queen band nerds out there was his connection of, of his Zoroastrian background and Iranian heritage um, in that day, England. So yeah, there, definitely there's that. I love that. That is uh, the spark for you is, is that band biopic. And we all know that Bohemian Rhapsody has an Arabic word in it. Hopefully all of our followers know that Bismillah is in it, Bohemian Rhapsody. There so go. there we go. That We're shedding off Alphazaic. That's all we need to contribute. And... I mean, <laughs> if Queen is the only tie-in I need for this website, I've made it, I think. So <laughs> in... Yes. Queen is epic. I, I grew up listening to Queen with my mom. We used to jam in the living room, in the car. It's just like Queen went on and it's just like, oh, it's that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. So, I, Abby, every time you're on, I need to find another cool pop cultural reference. Last week you did Game of Thrones with the Mamluk Empire. This week you did Queen with the Parthians. So whatever the next one will be, I cannot wait. My goodness. <laughs> I love that. No, I think that's fascinating too is, is the religion or religious differences between the Roman and the Parthian um, is really crucial. And, you know, Zoroastrianism directly translates to obviously Freddie Mercury, but a big swath of, of Iran's modern religious life. Do, do you know much more about if they had specific religious practices or whatnot, or just a Zoroastrian empire? So I actually didn't go into uh, their religious practices themselves. What I noticed is because again, I like to compare and contrast different empires. And I noticed that the way that they approached taking over new territory that might have a different religion was vastly different from what the Romans did. So at this time you see um, this monotheistic empire take over different swaths of land where you have people from very different religions. And what they did is just, they let them be. It, it's, it sounds simple, but it's also not something you usually see. It's just like, this is, they had um, Jewish people were uh, in their empire. You have people who are polytheistic, more like on along the lines of the Romans. You had people with uh, Greek polytheism as well. And they didn't enforce their own religion. And also what they didn't do is what the Romans did. The Romans used to conquer by conquering deities sometimes. Like they were literally like, here is a temple. We have taken over the temple. We have now conquered your deity. Your deity is now Roman. And they would either keep the same name or they would adopt or rephrase or give a new name. And they would create these cults around these deities with Romans instead. So they would conquer the deities. It's like, this deity is no longer yours, it is ours. And they would take it into their pantheon of gods. And then you see this other country or this other empire do the complete opposite. So it's like, you know what? We respect your form of government. We respect your um, ruling system and we respect your religion. As long as you pay uh, tribute to us and you don't uh, try to revolt, we're fine. And it's obviously it was more intricate than that, but it, on the surface, that's basically what they did. And it, I found it incredibly interesting. Do you think you, cause you had mentioned before how the Parthian empire did this very tactically uh, to avoid being overthrown by one of these uh, groups. Do you think, uh, you also said the word respect though. Do you think one or other was driving it and the Romans weren't as worried about the internal uh, overthrow or? Well, I like to think they were respectful, but. Yeah, no, I, I respect, I, I like to think that, but for the most part, I think the facade of respect can be something incredibly strategic. Mm -hmm. Like it, it wouldn't be like, oh, okay, you do you, meaning I'll do me. It was at least the way that I read it is more of a, you know what? I'm gonna appease you to a certain extent so you don't revolt. And that is basically that is 
how to manage an empire when it's increasing in size dramatically, while you're also in wars and uh, conflicts with a, new, a number of different empires, not just the Romans. And it's just finding a way to continue expanding and still try to avoid high levels of conflict within your own borders, which is, you can't completely get rid of the danger of conflict within your borders, but you can try and minimize it. And this is a way that they attempted to do so. Can you speak a little bit about their overthrow since we're talking about conflict and eventually they they failed? <laughs> um, so their overthrow, a lot of the different sources that I looked at, um, they focused on the fact that all the conflict that they had outside of their borders and within their borders just slowly chipped away what they could do. And so you do see during the different wars with Rome, the um, Parthian Empire contracting and then getting larger again. And so if you look at kind of the, there's a few really cool videos online that you can look at how the borders change through time. And so that in itself taxed the empire, but then you also have um, the Kushites attacking and then you have um, the Sassanid Empire emerges out. And it's because they were within their borders as one of the many different kingdoms. And they just did the same thing that the Parthians did. They took advantage of the context that they found themselves in. When the Parthians rose, it was because there was conflict both on um, the western side of the borders and they were on the east eastern side. And then you see um, another uh, governor rising and revolting. And then you see the person that ends up being the first king of Parthia taking advantage. Then fast forward uh, four and a half centuries and you see the same thing happen where the Sassanids arise out of the fact that you see massive conflict outside and within the borders and they take advantage. They find that time frame where it's like, I can do this now. I can revolt now and I won't be completely, completely obliterated. So it, it's just, it's interesting because try as they may to avoid history repeating itself, it still did do so. It, it, yes, it took four and a half centuries, but it happened nonetheless. It, it's really cool because in a little bit, we're kind of doing this in reverse in terms of the order of our civilization. <laughs> review. We did the Sasanian or Sassanid Empire about four weeks ago. We're doing the Parthians today and we're doing the Seleucids next, which is geographic or chronologically flipped, but um, they're all roughly about 400 years each as well. And, and I think all three of them and, and several other really long lasting empires really highlighted, maybe they didn't respect or otherwise, but at least the toleration and inclusion of minority communities, religious, ethnic, linguistic, otherwise. I think that's, that's somewhat from this being our ninth call, I'm no expert on ancient history by any <laughs> means, but some of, I think of the secret sauce of how these empires lasted so long um, is that uh, intentional inclusion and engagement with, with minority communities. Um, which I think is a great lesson modern countries can take today. So governments that hopefully are listening to this because we have such a <laughs> wide reach, um, listen to and, and see the success of previous ancient empires in their intentional, maybe not inclusion to all levels of government, but at least in daily life. Um, and instead of taking over their, their temple and changing the deity, uh, including them in the larger community. I think that's a really lovely lesson. Um, Wow, this this call has it all. A reference to Queen, <laughs> the Vatican, as well as now propaganda politics. What, go Parthians, my goodness. Very, very, very incredible. Any any final things you want to share about the Parthians um, with us tonight, Paula? Thank you again for writing this. This is such a great, great article. Um, oh, that's hard to say because there's just so much. I literally what I would have to say is that you can never stop learning from the Parthian Empire because there's so much information. Like what we did at uh, Civilization 101 is barely scratching the surface, but it's a perfect primer. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, I think that they were pretty, pretty awesome. It, we're talking about an empire that lasted a long time and proved to be a power in and of itself. It was a powerhouse of its time, so yeah. Well, everyone go check it out at the Alphusaic website. That's A-L-F-U-S-A-I-C dot N-E-T. Um, there's a whole bunch of other great empires. So, so please read them all. But thank you so much, Paula, for writing this. Excited to read all your other lessons learned articles from the Parthians, because that will definitely be something we would love to see. Uh, thank you, Abby, for your incredible pop culture references and just incredible insights. I think having a, a anthropologist on these calls is always really helpful. So can't wait for the next one. 
And thank you all our listeners for engaging on another phenomenal Civilizations in Review. Again, you can find us on our website, on our podcast, on our Instagram, on our YouTube, on our Facebook, which you're listening now, and all of our other social media, it will be there. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Go read up on the Parthians all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.